So if you look at this, right, if you guess 10 true false questions, how many possibilities are there? Well, we, we kind of talked about something a little similar to this in the last lecture, where we talked about um, how many ways can three people be seated in a, in a row? So, I mean, you might think, well, list all the possibilities. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> right? there, there's a lot. And I, I'm not looking forward to trying to do that. So um, another approach we, we can use here is, is to combine, kind of combine um, be, be systematic with looking for a pattern. Right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some smaller examples somewhere where it's practical to write out all of the all of the arrangements and see if I can see a trend. Right. So let's see. Um, let's say we're talking about uh, something that has. Let's see, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do number of questions. And over here, I'm going to put number of results. Okay, so let's say there's just one question, right? Easiest case, right? How many different possible ways are there to, to guess at this test? Well, there, there's only two. I can answer true or I can answer false. There's only two possibilities. All right, so let's up, the, let's up the game. Let's say there's two questions, right? Then what could I do? Well, I could answer true on the first and true on the second. Or I could answer true and false. Or false and true. Or false and false. And I think that's going to be all of them. So that brings me up to four. And let's say we go to three. Okay. Let's see. What are all, here's where I got to start to be systematic, right? I'm going to try to list all the ones that start with true. Well, I'm going to do true, true, and true. That's one possibility. Uh, let's, let's, let's do it this way. I'm, I'm changing my thinking. Let's say we try to do all the ones that have three trues, right? No falses. Well, that's the only possibility, right? That's the only way that could happen. Now, let's say I try to list all of the possibilities that have where you answer false on exactly one question. Okay, well, you could answer false on the last one. You could answer false on the middle one or false on the first one. Okay, so that's zero Fs. That's one F. How about two Fs? Okay, well, if you think about this for a second, one F or two Fs is the same as one true, right? So I'm going to I'm going to label this two Fs, but I'm going to think about this as being one true. So one possibility is true on the last question. You could do true on the middle question, or you can do true on the first question. Okay. Uh, what else? So th this leaves me with only one one more. You could answer three Fs. That's going to be false, false, and false. Okay, and I believe that's everything. Now, if I add these up, we get eight. And now I'm starting to see a pattern. Right, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Two is two to the first. Four is two squared. Eight is two to the third. And now at this point, uh, I'm not gonna write all these out, right? But you, you can test this, right? You can test out the methods, it's a good practice for, for the being systematic part. Um, I'm going to guess that four would be two to the fourth, which is 16. Okay, now are you seeing the pattern, right? The number of questions becomes the exponent. So if my pattern holds, and I'm pretty comfortable it's going to, 10 questions would be two to the 10th possible answers. That's 1,024, right? And there's my final result. 
Okay, an another technique you can use here is looking for a counterexample. In this case, I'm, I'm not so much trying to prove this is, this is correct as I'm trying to look for a way to say it's incorrect. Right? I'm trying to look for a way to invalidate this. Okay, and uh, this is one of my favorite things. This is absolutely not true. Um, a plus B quantity squared is not equal to A squared plus B squared. How can we see this? Well, you, you start looking at some numbers, right? And remember, when we're looking for a counterexample, it only takes one. If I can find one pair of numbers where this doesn't work, that's good enough. The whole thing is invalid. So let's say I try A equals 0, B equals 2. Okay, then the left-hand side is 0 plus 2 squared. That's 2 squared, which is 4. And the left side is 0 squared plus 2 squared. That's 0 plus 4, which is, uh-oh, 4. It came out equal. Okay, well, that's okay. It, it may be equal sometimes. But remember, that's not what equal says. Equal says equals all the time. So I'm going to keep looking. I'm going to keep looking. How about... If I try A equals 1, B equals negative 1. Remember what we talked about in the last section, right? In the last lecture. Mix it up. Don't just try all positive numbers. Get some positive, some negative. Let's see what that does. Well, that makes the left side 1 plus negative 1 squared, which is 0 squared, which is 0. What happens on the right side? The right side is 1 squared plus negative 1 squared. That's 1 plus 1. There you go, which is 2. And those are not equal, right? Not equal. So that is not a true statement because it isn't true all the time. Okay, another thing, I, this is a little less of a technical one, but this is an important one for, for you to bring to the table. You have to have some persistence. You know, you notice on the last one, right? I didn't work the first time. My first number looked like it was a true statement, but I kept moving forward. So, yeah, okay, let me try something else, right? Don't be discouraged by wrong answers, all right? Take that as, take that as an opportunity. Right, take a wrong answer as an opportunity to see why it doesn't work. Right? I mean, there, there's a famous story. Thomas Edison, he tried thousands of light bulbs, thousands of different types of metal for, for, to be the filament in a light bulb. And none of them worked. Right? They, they, were, they were all either they didn't burn bright enough or they burned out too fast or for some reason they didn't work. Well, I, or Edison's approaches wasn't that he had a thousand failures. It was that he had a, a thousand trials that gave him information. It wasn't the information he was looking for, but he still learned from it, right? So don't don't let yourself get discouraged. Don't be shy about walking away. If you need to take a break, take a break. Go take a walk, right? That's actually a very effective studying strategy when you get stuck on something. I, I have literally used this in my professional life. There have been times I have been stuck on a software problem. I can't, can't figure out how to get this thing to do what I wanted to do. And I would literally get up and take a walk around the building, right? Give my brain a rest, think about something else. Then when I came back, my, my brain was fresh and it had time to kind of think about it in my subconscious. And, and the answer kind of came to me, right? So persistence, right? Very important tool uh, to bring to the table. Um, finally, I, I kind of hit into this in the last one. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Right? I, I, I tell my students, and I know it sounds a little weird coming from a professor, but making mistakes can be good. When you make a mistake, that's an opportunity to learn. And that's an opportunity to learn how it doesn't work, which can be just as useful as learning what does. And so this, this brings us to our last one here, right? Um, and, and again, we're, we're back to kind of practical things. When, when you're faced with a word problem, this one is, is big, right? It is, you know, quite a bit going on here. Um, focus on the last sentence, right? And, and I know this goes kind of contrary to what you're told in your English classes, right? English professors, the English teachers, high school, whatever, they always say, oh, the, the first sentence is the most important one. It's the topic sentence. Okay, in technical writing, it's often the reverse, especially textbook situations like this, right? 
the most important sentence is often the last one because the last one is almost always the one that tells you what you want. Right? And you see that here. Find a linear equation. Excellent. Now I know what my final answer is going to look like. When I am stalled, when I'm all said and done here, I had better have a linear equation on the last line because that's what I'm looking for. Right, so the last sentence in, in, a, in a technical scenario like this is quite often the most important one. Okay, so now, now you have 10 strategies, right? 10 things to think about um, and, and apply when, when you're looking, you know, you're doing your homework or, or even when working on uh, practical problems in your personal life. So in the next lecture, um, we're, we're going to kind of try to generalize this a little bit and look at two different kinds of reasoning that you can use to draw conclusions based on you know facts evidence personal experience